Okay, thanks everyone for joining our UCNR Water Webinar. And today, you know, we are delighted to have uh, Grace Udmansi um, as our speaker. Uh, Grace is a UC Cooperative Extension um, Advisor um, located in the Cisco County in the Northern California. She earned her undergraduate degree in animal science and sociology from CSU Chico and master of science in agronomy at UC Davis. Um, her graduate work was focused on drought adaptation and um, using ranchers interviews to determine what management strategies were most effective in managing drought uh, conditions here in California. Um, she emphasizes uh, working with local ranchers. Um, she you know, something that she continues to develop um, in her new role. And you will get to hear some of her re more recent work. Um, so with that, Grace, take it away. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity um, to speak today. Um, I'm happy to be here to share a little bit of the work that um, myself and my colleagues, Tracy Shore, Dan Macon, and Leslie Roach have been doing on drought management and adaptation for California ranchers. Um, so as mentioned, I started this work as a grad student um, and I'm now continuing it as an advisor up in Siskiyou County on the Oregon border. Um, so I, I, was, I was just mentioning too, I'm, I'm coming, I'm at the very end of a cold right now. So I'm, I'm hoping that my brain fog doesn't get in the way too much, but if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, um, please please feel free to, to jump in. Um, oops. So just a bit of a roadmap to outline um, where we're heading for today. I'm going to start by giving a little bit of an overview on some of the research that we've done on these topics. Um, and specifically, kind of an overview of a 2011 survey and a series of interviews that we conducted in 2016 um, and how all of that work has informed a new decision support tool for ranchers. Um, and I'll walk through some of the features of that tool and kind of how we organized it. Um, so all of this work that we've done and the research that I'll be getting into in just a second is um, focuses specifically on rangeland livestock producers in California. So I wanted to start with a little bit of an overview of what these working landscapes look like um, across our state. So rangelands are really defined by their diversity, whether that be in terms of the forage type or the activities that these multiple use landscapes support. So um, the technical definition that we're working with here is um, in terms of rangeland is that it's defined as uncultivating land that provides the necessities of life for grazing and browsing animals. And often these landscapes are uncultivated due to physical limitations, so issues with topography or soil quality or temperature. Um, and instead, rangelands are dominated by native and introduced grasses and also shrubs and trees. Uh, but of course, um, that doesn't mean that rangelands aren't valuable. In fact, quite the opposite is true. Rangelands provide um, numerous environmental and social benefits, including clean water, wildlife habitat, open space, and of course, forage for both wild and domestic grazers. And our state is really dominated by rangeland. Um, almost 60% of California is classified as range. So our state really showcases the fact that rangeland landscapes are often found um, at the nexus of wildland and urban landscapes. So in addition, um, rangelands are, um, in addition to being a critical source of forage for grazing animals, um, Grazing animals can serve as a management tool to maintain or enhance the functioning of these rangeland landscapes and the ecosystem services they support. So um, in California, rangelands are supporting um, a $3 billion cattle and sheep industry. And the implications for um, the linkages between ranching and rangelands are broad. 
um, and touch on things like rural communities and food securities, food, food security and our state economy as a whole. So we've kind of discussed what rangelands in California look like broadly, but I also wanted to mention some of the challenges um, that are specific to ranchers operating on and managing these landscapes across the state. So um, the first is the diversity of range types that we have in California. So we have a wide range of both vegetation and land ownership types across our state. Um, which create region specific drought impacts. So um, an example of that, now that I'm up in Siskiyou living and working here, um, our challenges and solutions for drought are very different than um, the challenges and solutions that ranchers in Gillo or Butte County are facing um, in the Central Valley. It's also important to factor in California's unique Mediterranean climate. So California ranchers are are really accustomed to managing through our seasonal drought and typically have a plan developed to address challenges brought about by our long, hot, dry summers and variable rainy seasons. Um, but of course, a seasonal drought is very different than some of the severe multi-year droughts that we're, we're currently dealing with. But finally, it's important to consider um, land management type as well. So the implications of ranching on public versus private lands and the different drought management um, techniques and options that are available dependent on land type. So getting into a definition for drought, as, as all of you know, um, drought is difficult to define, but is generally regarded as a climate water deficit resulting in negative um, ecological, economic, and social impacts. And as I mentioned on the last slide, this is very different um, than a seasonal dry period that we experience in California's uh, Mediterranean climate. And this is a question that comes up um, a lot recently um, in my work with, with ranchers in Siskiyou County, is drought getting worse? Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge first that drought is nothing new to either ranch um, to either rangelands or ranching. Um, both have co-evolved with drought and are adapted to survive drought. However, we do see that the severity, frequency, and duration of droughts is increasing. Um, so some uh, mega drought effects are being worsened by climate change. Um, that is, without climate change, the mega drought wouldn't have um, had a as severe as, as of an impact as it has. And some work done by the authors listed below suggests that increasingly severe drought impacts that we are all experiencing can be attributed to the interacting effects of um, expected short-term drought conditions with long-term soil moisture deficits that are driven by climate change. So, because all of the research that I'll presenting here in just a second um, deals with the 2012 to 2016 drought in California, which was then known as California's historic drought, I wanted to reflect back um, briefly on what that drought looked like. So all of the images that you'll see here are from the US Drought Monitor. Um, and as you'll notice, the severity and duration of the 2012 to 2016 drought um, really tested the ability of land managers to adapt under some extraordinary conditions. So not just managing through um, an extreme water shortage or several years of low precipitation, but a combination of the two. So these severe multi-year droughts um, are really game changers for the ranching community. All re resources are restricted and often um, painful trade-offs must be made in order to keep the ranch in operation. So the ability to manage through these types of extreme disturbances is tied to adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity is the ability to respond to a disturbance, adjust, and learn through experience. And I, I think that's something that we can um, all relate to. Adaptive capacity is not specific to ranching or rangelands. Um, but really applies to every new challenge that we learn to live through and therefore increase our knowledge base and toolkit 
of how to survive and manage through the next challenge, hopefully a little bit more successfully. So for ranchers that are trying to survive a drought, um, this involves managing pressing threats like a lack of forage resources while protecting the long-term economic sustainability of their operation. So drought management planning is incredibly complex and is really unique to individual um, ranching operations and the goals of individual ranchers. So in order to research this and obtain information that's important for both management and policy decisions, we use the adaptive decision-making framework, which you can see um, on the right-hand side of the screen, in order to collect and categorize information. So this is helpful for research because we can ask questions that get at each one of the framework components that you see here. And then Extension can use that information to help develop resources to support um, drought planning and decision-making in the future. So the ADM framework outlines how ranchers manage through drought um, in, in four kind of broad categories. So their information resource network, um, goal setting, the management tools they use, and their previous experience with drought. And adaptation evolves over time as experience continues to shape each one of these components. So these four categories are where research and extension efforts can be concentrated. Um, we, we can't get anyone more experienced with drought per se, but we can share the experiences of others to help with decision making. And, and that's exactly what the goal of this work is. Um, so the research that I'll be discussing today is based on two separate but complementary efforts. So um, the surveys that were conducted in 2011 um, were, were deployed right at the beginning of the historic drought. So although the goal of those surveys was not drought specific, um, they did include some questions that, that assessed um, drought planning and perspectives that provided some really opportunistic baseline data heading into such a severe event. Um, and the 2016 interviews were developed specifically um, to dig into the topic of drought further and determine what worked and what didn't work based on the, um, the experiences of ranchers. So um, although these research efforts were meant to be complementary rather than paired, there were similar questions posed in both the surveys and the interviews that assessed um, drought impacts, drought management strategies, and rancher perceptions of drought. So those are kind of the three categories that I'll be talking about today, impact strategies and perceptions. So I wanted to touch just briefly on, on the demographic data from these two efforts. Um, and as you can see in terms of age and gender um, and experience in ranching, um, we're looking on average at the pretty similar groups of ranchers that were um, interviewed in 2016 and surveyed in 2011. So getting into um, drought impacts first. So no surprise here, um, the most severe impacts across the board um, were related to the reduction of forage and the reduction of income um, or increased expenses during drought in both 2011 and 2016. Um, I wanted to highlight though that in 2016, um, ranchers were asked to reflect on both past droughts and the current drought, the 2012 to 2016 drought. And you can see a large increase in reported impacts and also um, the severity of impacts that was, in, that was reported as well. Um, so getting into management strategies. So we were asking people about two broad categories um, of management strategies, proactive and reactive. So proactive strategies are those that are deployed in advance of a drought and reactive strategies are those that are deployed 
um, during a drought. So both, um, so the types of management strategies were pretty consistent between these two groups in terms of proactive and reactive strategies used. However, the number of drought management practices used by each operation appeared to increase between 2011 and 2016, particularly for the proactive strategies. So looking into that um, a little more thoroughly here, um, just to orient you to these graphs real quick, along the y-axis, you'll see the percent use of strategy, and along the x-axis, you'll see the strategy type. So in this first set of graphs, we have the reactive drought strategies that were um, used by study participants. So in the blue is the um, 2016 interview responses, and in the orange is the 2011 survey responses. Um, and you can see pretty, it's pretty similar across the board here in terms of what was used. We had the same top four reactive practices um, reported in each um, between years. Um, and then you'll see here the proactive drought practices that were used um, between um, the 2011 surveyed ranchers and the 2016 interviewed ranchers. So again, there were similar strategies used in terms of proactive practices, but you'll notice that individual practice adoption increased substantially. So for example, pasture rest, um, you'll notice that 92% of the interview ranchers reported using pasture rest as a proactive drought management strategy in 2016. Whereas in 2011, only 23% of these surveyed ranchers reported using pasture rest. Um, so looking at management strategies in terms of the total number used between groups. Um, so in 2011, 64% of surveyed ranchers reported using proactive management strategies. And then in 2016, 98% of the interviewed ranchers um, reported using at least one proactive practice to manage drought in their operation. Looking now at reactive strategies, 99% of the surveyed ranchers in 2011 reported using at least one management strategy to respond to drought whereas 98% of interviewed ranchers in 2016 were using at least three reactive practices. So we saw an increase um, in the total number of management strategies used by ranchers. Um, so combining what we saw on the last slide with this slide, there was an apparent increase in proactive practice use, both in terms um, of overall practice use and individual practice adoption. So what could be causing that? Um, one explanation is that the underlying drought conditions leading into 2012 might have been a catalyst for proactive drought planning. So in other words, um, the mega drought conditions that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation could have been a catalyst for ranchers in terms of incorporating new strategies into their operation. And we saw evidence of this continued or enhanced proactive drought planning um, in quotes from our interviewed ranchers in 2016. So ranchers said things like, we expect drought every year now. I'm not sure I'd really call it a drought plan. It's just our normal way of ranching now. My management always takes drought into account and drought will be more influential in our future operation plans because we know now how to better prepare. So getting now into drought perception. So these two questions that you see on the left side of the screen were asked in 2012 and repeated exactly or excuse me, were asked in 2011 in the surveys and were repeated exactly in the 2016 interview. So this offers kind of an interesting comparison of how perspectives 
um, were shaped by managing through the 2012 through 2016 drought. So 40, um, in response to the question, will drought be more influential in management planning in the next 10 years? In 2011, 43% of ranchers answered yes to that question, whereas in 2016, 71% of ranchers answered yes at the end of California's historic drought. Um, and in response to the question, if another drought were to begin right now, how severely would this impact the economic viability of your operation? In 2011, before the historic drought, um, surveyed ranchers, on, um, the majority said as severely or worse, whereas in 2016, at the end of the drought, the majority of ranchers said um, less severe. So it seems like in 2016, ranch managers believe that drought would be more influential in their future management planning, but that their current management strategies would be adequate to mitigate future drought impacts, which seemed a little contradictory. But one explanation for that could be that um, after managing through the 2012 to 2016 drought, ranchers could have been feeling both more prepared and the severity of those historic drought conditions could have made it feel difficult to imagine um, worse future drought conditions. So, um, You'll see um, the orange quotes here. Um, we already uh, we already saw these when discussing the increase in proactive practice adoption, and then these red quotes um, really capture kind of how difficult this drought was for ranchers and how how emotionally distressing it was. So, um, interviewed ranchers said things like. I fed hay every day for 14 months. I am mentally and physically tired. If another drought were to start right now, then we would probably sell out. The stress would be too much and I will be scarred by this experience. Um, so getting a little bit into kind of um, the take home of this work before we start discussing um, the drought decision support tool specifically. So our ranch level take home points really informed the way we developed the drought decision support tool. So um, we found that about half of ranchers had a written drought management plan in place. So there's some opportunity there just um, to increase um, or you know how, how many folks have their plan actually written down versus having no plan or having kind of a plan that's that's just in their head. Um, of course, having a portfolio of both proactive and reactive drought management strategies is really important, particularly for managing through these severe multi-year events. Um, and looking at the effectiveness of proactive strategies in the future will be even more important um, as we continue to, man to um, manage through these types of really severe multi-year drought on, um, on rangelands. So also not uh, evaluating risks and trade-offs of, of proactive strategies from an economic perspective um, will be important as well. Um, and at the community level, um, we know that peer networks are really important um, for ranchers, that ranchers learn best from other ranchers and support organizations can help contribute to that. And at a policy level, our work adds to the growing body of research, emphasizing that drought plans are not one size fits all. So the policy that we develop must be designed to support the region specific impacts of drought um, and the individual characteristics of the ranchers that are managing through it. So now getting into the decision support tool specifically. Um, so we kind of thought originally as that um, of the 2012 to 2016 drought as being historic, but uh, the drought that we're currently in may be the new historic drought. So 
Um, I started my job as the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor in Siskiyou County during the middle of this potentially new historic drought and was noticing that a lot of the drought management tools for ranchers in um, other Western states, but, but there weren't as many tools for California ranchers. And um, I think that differences in our forage resources in California um, and also our production systems create a really kind of unique environment in California. So we primarily have annual grasslands in California. Um, our ranchers typically calve in the fall. So they are on Central Valley rangeland in the wintertime and then move to either irrigated pasture or mountain uh, rangeland, rangeland allotments in the summertime. So in this type of system, um, not just the quantity of rainfall, but really the timing of rainfall is, is very important and makes a huge difference, particularly in our annual systems. And I think that we've seen that um, in particular in this new drought that we're currently in, um, across the state, what I've been hearing from ranchers, but also from colleagues, is that variable germinating and also spring rains have created some pretty huge impacts on both forage quantity and forage um, quality. And of course, as we're in um, the third year of extreme drought, um, folks, are, folks are pretty maxed out on what options they have available um, to continue managing through this type of event. So given all of that, and um, we wondered if our research could provide a, job, a jumping off point for a decision support tool that was detailed enough to be useful, but open-ended enough to account for some of these um, California specific variables. So um, I collaborated with my colleague, uh, Dan Macon, who's also a livestock and natural resources advisor um, to develop this decision support tool. Um, so first and foremost, there is no right way to plan for drought. Um, there are so many factors that go into creating a drought plan um, that is tailored to an individual ranch's um, environmental circumstances, but also an individual operator's goals. So nothing can replace the insight that each individual rancher has into their own operation. Um, and that's why we, we wanted to be pretty intentional about calling this a decision support tool rather than a drought management tool. So the goal is that this tool can provide a starting point that fits the needs of each individual rancher. It can be used as a worksheet, as a conversation starter with family or with a management team, or even just an opportunity to consider or revisit some of the questions that we pose um, in the tool. And if you think back to some of our ranch level takeaways from the research, um, having a written drought management plan in place is important and there's a big opportunity to increase um, how many folks have their drought management plan written down. So this type of tool can help support that. And overall, our goal is that this tool will evolve over time based on feedback from ranchers. So we see um, a drought plan having kind of uh, three key purposes. So the first is that it can set um, deadlines or critical dates for making important decisions. Uh, a drought plan can also help prioritize objective decision making during a time when many difficult decisions must be made. And if you think back to some of those quotes that we pulled from um, the interviews, uh, drought, man drought management, particularly during a multi-year drought event, can be really an emotionally taxing time for ranchers. So that's what we're trying to get at with prioritizing objective rather than, than emotional decisions. And um, finally, a drought plan can help pair proactive and reactive strategies to help ranchers avoid sunk costs. So a sunk cost can occur when um, a rancher has invested in a specific proactive tool 
um, like conserving forage for pregnant cows, but then decides to implement a reactive tool like culling those cows during drought that does not realize the benefit of the investment. Um, in addition, flexibility is really key in all of this because as we've talked throughout the presentation, um, rangelands and ranching operations are, are variable and unique. So strategies can provide flexibility in two ways. Um, it can provide flexibility in demand or flexibility in supply. So um, one example of that, um, demand flexibility might include adding um, stockers in a good forage years or selling older cows um, during a drought. Supply flexibility might include stockpiling forage during good years or seasons to save it um, for years or seasons that are more dry. So the first part of the drought decision support tool is all about goal setting and taking inventory. Um, so taking stock of what information um, the ranch already has can help um, fill in the rest of the tool, but can also help identify areas um, where the rancher might want to collect more information or data in. Um, so uh, some examples of the data that a ranch could already be collecting are provided in the box in the right-hand corner. And then some examples of the questions that we're asking in part one um, are about whether or not the, the drought plan is written down, um, what types of outcomes would make a drought plan a success, what strategies they're currently using, what impacts they're most concerned about, and whether the strategies that they're already using are helping um, to mitigate those impacts. So the second part of the tool is all about the planning calendar. So writing out your forage calendar in advance um, creates opportunities to adjust uh, a ranch's drought management plan um, in advance of kind of finding a gap in that forage calendar. So um, essentially this is getting at the flexibility piece. If you can identify what parts of your calendar um, may be light on forage, may have a forage gap in advance of actually um, realizing that, it can provide more options to pivot to depending on circumstances. Um, part three of the decision support tool is looking at avoiding sunk costs and pairing the proactive and reactive strategies that that we've kind of been talking about throughout the presentation. So um, if you so let me orient you to this table real quick. We have um, proactive strategy, common proactive strategies at the top of the table, um, reactive strategies at the bottom of the table, and strategies that focus more on forage um, supply flexibility are in blue, whereas strategies that focus more on demand flexibility are in yellow. So one example of kind of how to pair these strategies, if you've gone through the effort of conserving forage as a proactive strategy, it might be worth looking at the cost to haul stock water um, to make use of that forage before starting to implement a reactive strategy like culling cows, for example. Um, so part four deals with the economic analysis or um, evaluating how much these strategies will cost and how much they'll save. So Dan actually developed some partial budgets um, for some of the most common drought management strategies that I'll share in just, in just a few minutes. Um, but this has been, been the area that most of the feedback on the tool has been centered on. Ranchers really want more information about how to evaluate the economics of their decision. So the partial budgets have been well received. And I think this is, this is one area where we could even grow the tool um, in the future. 
And the final part, part five of the plan is focused on recovery, recovery and reflection, which are really vital components of a, of a drought management plan that supports the ranch for the long haul and prioritizes resilience. So if you think back to the adaptive decision-making framework that we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, reflecting on the drought management plan really um, allows ranchers to complete the cycle of adaptive learning and management because we know that adaptation evolves over time as experience continues to shape each one of these components of the, of the adaptive um, decision-making framework. So I think it's really important to realize that drought planning and management is an iterative process. Um, planning, learning, reevaluating priorities and planning again um, is kind of what it's all about. So not getting it right the first time doesn't mean that a ranch's drought management plan is bad. It means that the ranch has more um, data specific to their operation that can inform the next decision. So once again, having a written plan um, is kind of the foundation of that process. Um, because over time, it can allow you to track what works and what doesn't work for the operation during a given year. So let me pull up the tool real quick. Um, can you guys see this now instead? Of, okay, cool. So um, this drought decision support tool is available um, on both Dan and my um, extension website. So just wanted to show you real quickly what it looks like. Um, this is the, the introduction, kind of the inventory and data collection piece I talked about at the beginning. Um, part two is planning your forage calendar. So this is your opportunity to identify um, areas where there might be a, a gap in forage supply during a drought year. Um, part three, here's that table that will look familiar, is about um, pairing the proactive and reactive strategies. And then here are a couple questions that get at the economic analysis piece and refer back to those partial budgets that I mentioned. And then finally, the tool finishes out um, with the recovery and reflection piece. And these um, partial budgets are also available on our extension website. So um, there's an option for beef producers, and then there's an option um, for sheep producers as well. So um, these cells are already set up to kind of calculate totals. And there are a couple um, tabs at the bottom that have some common um, drought management strategies. So we have one um, here about feeding hay, um, one that would allow you to analyze um, what culling cows would do to your bottom line, and then one for early weaning. Um, and so once you input all of your ranch specific information here, there's an example column on the left. Um, you can kind of look at the total of how much, um, how much expense that strategy would add. Um, so one question kind of we get a lot in extension, like we're talking about drought planning, but we're already in the middle of a pretty severe multi-year drought that's coming on the, on the heels of the 2012 to 2016 drought. So after just a couple um, normal years of precipitation, we're kind of back in the thick of things. So for ranchers right now operating through some really challenging conditions in 2022, what, what can they do? Um, so I think um, there are a couple things. First, using those partial budgets um, can still help. Um, so a lot of ranchers now are in the position where they're, they're mostly making reactive decisions um, because of, 
of um, we are in year three and it is a severe drought. So using those partial budgets and relying on the economics can can help keep those difficult decisions more objective and less emotional. Um, starting to document and collect data um, is important and using that to develop a written um, plan later can be really helpful. And then of course, there are some um, county level resources that can be really useful for ranchers, um, farm service agency, cooperative extension and other support organizations can be um, really helpful during, um, during years like 2022. Um, so finally, I wanted to thank our, um, our funders for this work. Um, the Vestici Endowment was a funder as well as the um, Renewable Resources and Extension Act grant. And then the California Cowmen's Association and the California Wool Growers um, were supporters of this project as well. Um, again, thank you to um, co-authors and collaborators, Dan Macon, Tracy Shore, and Leslie Roach. And then I've listed um, our publications based on this work below. And um, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. <clears throat> yeah, uh, folks, if you want to, if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask or put it in the chat and I will be happy to read it out loud. So, oh, yes, I will drop a link to the tool in the chat. And um, I would be happy. Uh, to talk about the tool more if anyone has questions or if, if anyone wants to modify it or anything like that for their specific clientele. I, I think I can speak for, um, for Dan as well when I say we're really open to that kind of thing like and happy to have the conversation if that's something that you're interested in. Yeah, thanks. All right, so there's a question from Ellen. Um, can you tell us about your sample for the survey? How did you get farmers to participate? Is it a representative sample? So the 20, that's a good question. Um, the 2011 survey was led by Dr. Leslie Roach. And the goal of the survey was to um, just kind of collect a, a lot of different baseline information about what ranchers were, um, what their biggest challenges were, and uh, kind of where they wanted research and extension efforts to be concentrated in. So um, I believe Dr. Roach used a multi-contact approach for that survey. Um, she sent it out multiple times. There were multiple reminders, um, but partnering with the industry organizations can be really, really helpful for, for getting buy-in um, for, for survey work like that. It wasn't necessarily a short survey because there was a lot of information to be gleaned, but having the California Cowmen's Association and the California Wool Growers involved in helping to promote it um, with their membership was um, really helpful in kind of um, uh, getting responses back for sure. Um, oops. Okay, I think there was a follow-up question on that. Um, how come there were so many fewer responses in 2016 survey? Good question. So the 2016 effort was um, were interviews, not surveys. So they were much more in-depth, thorough, and time-consuming. So again, um, California Cowmen's Association and wool growers were um, a starting point for um, snowball sampling. And that's how they were able to get the 48 interviews, um, interviewees enrolled. And those folks were um, from across the state. So again, um, looking at these two different um, kind of efforts in a complementary way, not in a direct comparison, because they were um, they were separate efforts for sure. 
Okay, so the next question is, what are your thoughts on the use of Posture Map app as a proactive adaptive management strategy tool? Yeah, I, it's exciting to see some of the um, kind of remote sensing tools coming online to help folks with um, forecasting um, forage production. Um, I think that's what the pasture map um, tool is getting at is kind of a, a forage forecasting tool, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think they can be really great um, aspects of a, a drought plan. It does get a little challenging in parts of California because of our annual grass system and the really heavily forested areas of our state as well. So I know some of those tools um, kind of transferred directly to the rangeland type that's more dominant in um, the central plains. But when you get into the annual grasslands and the forested areas, it can be a little challenging um, to get a, a really accurate reading from some of those apps. But not to say they aren't they aren't useful. I, I think that they can be one part of a strategy for sure, depending on where you're at and what what forage type you're working with. Yeah, and I have a, I have a question uh, for you, Grace. So, I mean, given the Mediterranean climate, I guess the you know ranchers in California they're used to seasonal drought, right? It's not something mm -hmm. new. It's really that this multi-year drought that is compounding now that they may have not experienced before. Um, mm -hmm. So, how much is that the direct impact where maybe the less precipitation is affecting the forage, um, you know, on the ranch directly versus these kind of indirect that is kind of coming down you know more from the policy side of things you know things like sigma where there's not enough water and people are trying to make use you know and put the water where you know the best return on investment is so how much is like you know this maybe the indirect effect is actually feeding into that's making the, the life of branches even more difficult yeah that's a really good question and that's something i'm still trying to wrap my mind around as an advisor for sure um so I, I think it's both. I think um, when you're when you're thinking of rangeland forage production, it is all about precipitation for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, so it it transfers pretty directly in that respect. But because irrigated pasture lands and hay, which is an irrigated crop, of course, is really linked to a lot of um, you know, sigma and um, other curtailment orders that are happening across the state, that's, that's a big pressure point. And mm -hmm. um, we have curtailment orders in both the Scott and Shasta River watershed um, in Siskiyou County. And that the impacts of that has been, have been really variable too. I mean, some people have been able to switch to uh, growing small grains like an annual crop instead of um, a hay crop for the year, but not everyone. Um, and the other impact that that has it is not just on irrigation water ability, but also um, stock water, just drinking water. And um, that can also, drinking water availability can, can impact uh, rangeland forage use as well. So that was something that some of our folks on mountain allotments saw in Siskiyou. Our late season rains were able to benefit the perennial grasses on uh, mountain ranges, but not everyone had the stock water availability to make use of that forage. So even though there was grass in the mountains, because of our snowpack, um, there just wasn't a lot of water available to support um, drinking water for livestock. So it's really complex. I think both the indirect and the direct play a role in it for sure. And just a follow up, seeing nobody else is asking a question: um, Is is heat becoming a problem now? Um, I mean, the water and forage is, is one side of the story, but I, I, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, we feel it that it's getting hotter, right? Mm -hmm. And perhaps animals, you know, do it too. So is is that becoming a you know a, a new issue in California's you know ranching industry? Yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit about heat stress more from my colleagues in the southern part of the state. 
Um, it's not something that's that's as big of a concern um, up in Siskiyou. I mean, we, we do have um, longer, hotter periods in the summertime, but nothing nothing that would be like a huge animal welfare concern. But I think that's becoming something that folks in the Southwest and Southern California are looking at more um, and looking at trade-offs with different breed types that are more adapted to heat and stuff like that. Yeah, every time when I come to campus, I see cows kind of hiding under a tree. Like, you know? yes, yeah, they're good at finding the trees. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Just kind of you know, wondering about it. Okay, so I think we have one more question in the chat. Do you have a sense of the accessibility of ranchers to USDA programs uh, like forage disaster program, and if it has helped to mitigate some of the impacts of the ongoing drought? Yeah, so I think um, like for the farm services agency, farm service agency programs that help with cost sharing that are related to disasters. Um, very, very important, like critical support for ranchers during a really difficult time. Um, you know, one, one issue with having a west-wide drought and not just a drought that's in California is that hay prices right now are astronomical. So, People need more hay than normal, and hay is, I think, you know, four hundred dollars a ton. That's not sustainable um, for most folks to purchase hay for several months throughout the year. So, having some cost sharing support to make it through tough times is is important. And FSA provides some programs that do that. Um, the other part of this is the wildfire impact that's um, related to drought. And um, FSA supports some um, some of that kind of recovery as well with fencing, but also just livestock mortalities during wildfire. We had a couple pretty big fires up in Siskiyou County this summer that definitely impacted ranchers um, because they're all out on rangeland allotments during the summertime when these fires typically come through. So uh, I do think those programs are accessible and most ranchers have a good relationship with their local farm service agency office and their county directors. Um, I think it can be a little challenging as with any program to get all the paperwork in order, but um, having the relationship with, a, with your local office can really help with that. And I think most ranchers um, do that. So that's a good question. Any more last minute thought? If not, um, then join me thanking Grace for taking the time and, and giving this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for the opportunity, everyone. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, well, enjoy your winter break and we'll, we'll hopefully see you back again in 2023. Take care, everyone.